Okay, welcome. Our project, like Dr. Lee said, is a novel sensor for gluten detection. The design project members are myself, Zach Jacoby, Amina Ahmed, Nishi Bhatt, and Natasha Von Liesept. Our identifier is O4. So, a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We want to talk about our motivation, why we chose this problem. We want to talk about our design process, how we went from customer requirements to our final design. We'd like to talk about the fabrication we went through, the steps that took us from the raw materials to our finished product. The, uh, next is the validation, the tests we did to make sure the device works correctly. And finally, we'd like to give some concluding remarks and next steps. So one of our group members, Natasha, has celiac disease. She's tired of having reactions to food that should be gluten-free. So we've designed a sensor that allows celiac patients to actively manage their disease rather than passively relying on labeling and assurances. So what is celiac disease? Celiac disease is an autoimmune disorder that destroys the villi in the intestines. So right here you can see a normal patient's villi and a celiac patient's villi. Uh, the villi are almost completely gone in a celiac patient. This leads to a lack of surface area for absorption of nutrients and ultimately can cause cancer, anemia, osteoporosis, infertility, epilepsy, pain, and malnourishment. It's estimated that 1 in 133 Canadians have celiac disease. This is about 340,000 people. There is no cure for celiac disease. There's only treatments. Uh, and the only treatment, really, is maintaining a strict gluten-free diet. For something to be classified as gluten-free, it must contain less than 20 parts per million of gluten. Any more than this, and gluten will begin binding to the villi, and the body will then attack the villi to get rid of the gluten. And that leads to the celiac progression. Um, so we've picked 20 parts per million as the detection limit for our sensor. Uh, and the final motivation was that the current detectors we've looked at aren't that good. Uh, they tend not to be aimed at consumers. They're aimed more at food processing plants or restaurants. This type of detector would require you to take a sample and then send it off for ELISA analysis at another lab. The tests that are aimed at consumers tend to have two big disadvantages. They're very slow. They often take up to 30 minutes, uh, after which time your food has gotten cold. And they're pricey. Uh, some of the ones we've looked at are 15 to 20 dollars, which means that the detector that tells you if you can eat the food costs much more than the food you're trying to eat. We also found uh, a startup or two with no product. Six Sensor Labs is an example of that class. So talking to uh, celiacs and other people who couldn't consume gluten, we came up with a set of customer requirements. The primary requirements were sensitivity. So it needs to be able to detect foods that have 20 parts per million of gluten. And it needs to be able to show that these foods aren't safe for the consumer. The second uh, primary requirement is portability. It needs to be airy, easy to take with you and carry around so you don't feel chained to your home to use it. Secondary requirements include ease of use. So you don't have to follow a complicated procedure in order to use the device. Uh, um, Self-contained, so you don't have to lug around anything else in order to be able to use the test. We'd also like to increase the sensitivity to 10 parts per million to give our customers extra peace of mind and speed so that it's quick enough that they don't have to worry about their food going cold. Tertiary requirements are unit cost, so making it very cheap so that using it is not a rare luxury, and range of uses, uh, meaning that it can be used in all sorts of food and drink. So from these, we came up with a set of options. And we evaluated these options on several criteria. So the first question is, should we use a color metric test, a fluorescent test, or an electric test? So color metric tests uh, use a change in color to signify the presence or absence of a target. Fluorescent tests use the emission of low energy photons when excited by high energy photons to show the presence or absence of their target. And electric tests would have some sort of change in uh, voltage, current, capacitance, or resistance in response to a target. Then, what sort of sensing molecule do we want to use? Antibodies and aptamers are two choices that are commonly used. 
And uh, so antibodies are immune proteins that are very specific to a single target. And aptamers are 3D DNA molecules that by their structure bind tightly to a single target. The next question is, should our device be based on solution or work in lateral flow? Uh, so solution devices that you may have seen are the pH dependent dyes used for titration, whereas a lateral flow method tends to use a membrane. It's things like pregnancy tests. And finally, should it be reusable or disposable? Uh, so we went with a colorimetric detector. Colorimetric has the great advantage of requiring no extra hardware to use. So electric detectors would require you to have some sort of power source, and fluorescent detectors require you to have a source of UV light. Whereas you can just observe visually the change in a colorimetric process. Uh, we've included two different spectra that you might see in a colorimetric device, and they're colored according to what the spectra would actually give you. So it's easy to discern by the naked eye. Uh, for our sensing molecule, we chose aptamers, because aptamers are cheap, and easy to find. Uh, antibodies tend to be fairly expensive and they're very difficult to make on your own because you need to ensure the correct post-translational modifications occur. Those don't occur in bacteria, so you can't just grow them in E. coli. Uh, the next question was solution-based or lateral flow. The choice for us here wasn't entirely clear. Uh, it's much simpler to do something in solution often, but lateral flow uses far less reagent, so it'll be cheaper, and it also has no risk of spilling. We've included a picture of our current results in solution, uh, and you can see a wide range of colors that we've observed, and our attempt at a lateral flow uh, strip, which currently isn't working. In the future, we may like to expand to lateral flow. And the last question is, should our test be reusable or disposable? We went with disposable so that we don't have to worry about proper cleaning procedures and how things degrade over their lifetime. So to give a quick overview of our chosen method, we're using a gold nanoparticle aptamer-based sensor. Gold nanoparticles are commonly used to uh, add a colorimetric component to other tests. Uh, just a quick note, AUNP is a common shorthand for gold nanoparticles. So our method is currently in solution, but we have the potential to expand it to lateral flow. We prepare aggregates in lab, and they disaggregate in the presence of gluten. So the underlying chemistry of our sensor takes advantage of gold nanoparticles' inherent color changing ability with respect to aggregation versus dispersion. We use this property to create our colorimetric assay. The thylated gold nanoparticles are able to bind to the DNA, or the aptamer, and this causes aggregation and makes the color change from red to blue, as you can see in the top picture. Then if you add gluten to, this, if you add gluten to the sensor, the aptamer will bind preferentially to gluten, and this will cause dispersion of the gold nanoparticles and change the color from blue back to red, again seen in the top picture. Now this is the ideal situation, you'd get like a really sharp change in color from red and blue. And below you can see a picture of our actual results in lab. You can see our aggregates made more of like a deep purple color and with gluten, with an addition of gluten, you got more of a light pink color. But you can still see a pretty clear change in color. If you add something that doesn't have gluten in it, the color should stay purple because the aptamers will not bind to anything that isn't gluten, so everything will stay aggregated and you will not have a color change. So this graphic shows how our DNA is actually conjugated to our gold nanoparticles. The first way that it's been done pretty often is called a salt aging process, and it uses a thylated, gold, thylated DNA, or thylated aptamers. So thylated just means that there's a sulfur group attached to the DNA. So you can see you basically have NaCl and uh, about a neutral pH as well, and your DNA is able to bind to the gold nanoparticle pretty well. You get a really good surface coverage and a lot of free aptamer space so that you can actually have binding to your target analyte. Um, this process takes about at least 10 hours, a little bit more than that. Now you can see in the next part of the picture, the second part there, you can see that uh, with the same conditions, the pH 7.6 and NaCl, if you use non-thylated DNA, you actually don't get a very good surface coverage. All the DNA is kind of wrapped onto the gold nanoparticle, you don't get a lot of free space so that the gluten or any target is able to bind. So this kind of renders our center inoperable. So our third process actually involves non-thylated DNA as well. But if you lower the pH by using a citrate HCl buffer, you can see you get a really good surface coverage with a lot of free DNA able to bind. As well, your uh, time to create the sensor goes down. It's only about three minutes for the actual binding. 
So with the theory that you just saw on the last slide, this is their actual application of it in the lab. We made the sensor by mixing two and a half microliters of our aptamer with 100 microliters of gold nanoparticles. And then to bring the pH down to pH 3 like we needed for the binding, we would add citrate HCl buffer, about two microliters of it. Vortex this for about 30 seconds and incubate at room temperature for an hour. We found that we needed more time than the three minutes that was shown in the paper uh, just to be able to get a really deep color of aggregates and know for sure that everything is aggregated properly. And you can see in the picture, before incubation, the deep red of the dispersed gold nanoparticles versus after the hour incubation, the purple color showing that we have aggregated gold nanoparticles. So we went through some trial and error in our quest to be able to find the best sensor possible. According to the original procedure we were following, heap solution was added after the incubation time to be able to bring the pH back up to neutral. However, when we did this step, we found that it actually caused dispersion of our gold nanoparticles. You can see in the picture on the top, on the left is without heaps, and you see the purple of the aggregates. But then after adding heaps, it goes to red, showing that the nanoparticles dispersed. This actually, again, renders our sensor inoperable because the nanoparticles are already dispersed. So we removed this step. Another step that was originally in the procedure was to wash our sample with uh, five, millimolar H, uh, 5 millimolar heaps. You would basically centrifuge it, pellet it, and then do some washes to try and remove any free DNA. However, we found that this resulted in a very heavy dilution effect, as a lot of our aggregates actually ended up in the supernatant as well. And you can see in the picture the progression. After the first and second wash, you still see some sample, and after the third, it's basically gone. So again, we decided to take out this step. We also attempted to use thiolated versus, we also attempted uh, different experiments with thiolated and non-thiolated gold nanoparticles themselves. Um, we wanted to try using gold nanoparticles that were not thiolated because this would help reduce on cost and it was easy to obtain. However, we saw that with non-thiolated gold nanoparticles, there wasn't even any aggregation after our incubation time. So again, the sensor wouldn't work properly if there, were no if there was no aggregation. With our thiolated gold nanoparticles on the left, you see we have a very deep purple color. Again, we got our aggregates, so we'll be able to use this for our sensor. So now that we have a sensor that is working in terms of we can see a color change with the naked eye, we wanted to be able to see, we want to be able to quantify this further. And we, we decided to use NanoDrop UV Viz be able to see the change with the binding of Aptamer and with the addition of gluten and something that is gluten free. So the first test we did was to check, with, uh, check if our Aptamer was actually causing the binding properly. So we wanted to see the shift in UV. So the red spectra that you see is our gold nanoparticles and the blue spectra is our gold nanoparticles with the Aptamer conjugation. So they're actually in aggregate form. And you can see a pretty clear shift and peak to the right as absorbance, absorbance of course changes with the increase in the size of aggregates. In our actual experimental results, you can see in the top corner, you can see the clear color change of just the gold nanoparticles on the left, which is the red, and the aggregates on the right, the purple. In terms of disaggregation, we wanted to see that with the addition of gluten, we'll be able to find an actual change in color. And we also, we also wanted to see if the peaks would shift back. And we were able to see that. We did gluten at 20 ppm. Uh, this, of course, is a concentration which triggers a reaction in celiacs. And the green spectra is the gluten, and you can see it goes back to almost the same as the gold nanoparticle spectra with almost full recovery of the sample. Uh, this shows, again, yeah, that our sample was able to redisperse properly, and we were able to see the color change, as you can see in the picture on the top. Next, we wanted to be able to test our specificity. We wanted to make sure that our, uh, that our gold nanoparticles would not disperse with uh, the addition of just any substance. So we tested this by using certified gluten-free coconut flour. We, d we added the, gluten flour, the coconut flour under the same conditions, so 20 ppm, uh, everything else, the solvent is dissolved in the same. And you can see the brown spectra is the coconut flour, and it has very little deviation from just the aptamer conjugated gold nanoparticles. And you can also see in the picture above, on, your left, on the very left is the gluten sample, the much paler pink color. The middle is our coconut flour sample, and then on the right you have just the aggregates. So you can see the coconut flour and aggregates don't show much of a change at all. In terms of unit cost, we're, down, we're at about 13.66 per sample with the cost of just the DNA and ap the aptamer and the nanoparticles factored in, as these are our major, major reagents and samples. So to conclude, we have a working solution in prototype form right now, which means that we have been able to meet all of our primary goals in terms of sensitivity and portability. Right? And we've also been able to meet many other goals as well, including speed and ease of use. And we want to just look at a couple other goals in the future, including uh, increasing the sensitivity and being able to decrease the unit cost. So for our next steps in that same line, we want to increase sensitivity by checking uh, what our detection limit fully is. We know it already works at the concentration we need. 
uh, but we want to be able to find its full tests and we want to be able to test its full capabilities and find its limits. We also want to be able to find its response to different concentrations, its response to heat. So our, our patients will of course use it in, with hot food as well. We need to make sure that doesn't change results in any way. And we want to be able to move it into a test strip form. So you know, you've all heard of like a pregnancy test, lateral flow method. It would be easier to actually carry around and use on a regular basis. This would also decrease our unit cost quite a bit. Finally, we want to be able to expand to other allergen, allergens and be able to broaden our market base. So to kind of sum things up, everyone we've talked to with celiac disease or who is unable to consume gluten agrees that the current paradigm just isn't acceptable to them. Uh, so it's just a continual challenge for them to ensure that their food is gluten free. We've presented a sensor that's very competitive in terms of price and is much faster than any other options on the market. Uh, future work would allow us to deliver something that's both cheaper and faster than anything else. Quickly, we'd like to acknowledge a lot of people who have helped us along the way. Uh, Yasmin Mastami, Jen Coggan, Dr. Zhuen Liu, Dr. Elizabeth Myring, Dr. Pu Chen, and our consultant, Dr. Christine Morsoli. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yeah, um, so in general, optimers tend to be pretty specific. So my biggest concerns would be if the food is at a really odd pH or if it's really hot. And that's the sort of things we'd have to do a lot of testing to determine. So is gluten a protein or? Uh, so gluten is a composite of two proteins, uh, gliadin and glutenin. I believe our aptamer is specific for gliadin. gliadin. And the length of aptamer is? Uh, 43. 43. I think one comment is that your golden nanopod cost can be going down significantly. Not that it's a cost like $13, but that's too much. Okay. That was for our solution based, and if you want to move over to a test strip format, it'll actually go down quite a bit, so our overall cost will be about 90 cents per test strip. We did have to make some estimates with the gold nanoparticle cost, so it could be that that inflated the price. Mm -hmm. Other questions? What's your shelf life? Uh, well, right now, uh, we haven't done a full study specifically just for shelf life. This is more of like a proof, in, uh, yeah, proof of concept to be able to see that it'd be able to bind. But we have some samples that we've kept uh, for up to, I believe, three weeks in the fridge, and they uh, you can like with the with the, just the aggregates themselves, they actually stay in solution. They don't crash out or anything. And of course, after you use the test, it will be disposed of anyway. So you have to keep it in the fridge, the sensor. I believe right now we're saying that you would keep it in the fridge until you take it out for use. It would be okay at a temperature for maybe a couple hours, that kind of thing, when you're going out for the day. But otherwise, you keep it in the fridge overnight. We've been keeping our samples in the fridge uh, just to keep them well. We've had aggregates out all day, and they haven't changed at all today. Um, We've been somewhat limited in how long we could do shelf life testing by the fact that it just started working a couple of weeks ago. So that's kind of where we have samples from, right? We have a data for two weeks, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, barring a time machine, we can't conduct long-term studies. During the validation process, how many samples do you run? Like, uh, do you see any variance between the samples? We ran quite a few gluten samples specifically, of course, to see our proof of concept. Uh, they all changed initially with our tweaks in, param tweaks in the procedure. With the original procedure, we saw a very, very faint change in color. But now that we've made some tweaks, we saw a much more pronounced pinkish color. And then with the coconut flour, we've done, uh, I believe, two or three samples with that. And we're planning on moving on to other samples as well. OK, uh, let's take speakers. Yeah. Uh, so we talked uh, briefly about uh, competitors. Um, I don't believe we've seen any other tests using the same mechanism. They're all antibody based, uh, and they do tend to be much more expensive than even our possibly inflated cost estimate. And they also take far longer than our almost instantaneous results. And they're not as portable either. When would you expect to see something like this on the market? It would take a lot more testing first to be able to validate it and things like that. But 
Yeah. Sensors will continue to get better as uh, people spend more time researching them. So we'll see. Okay. Okay. Uh, so thanks.